Hello everybody, my name is Jim Mackey and I'm the Animal Behaviour Management Officer for the Zoological Society of London. We wanted to share with you this uh, particular case study of um, Colobus in a new development at ZSL London Zoo. And I'm going to let my colleague Jacob talk you through the training programme that accompanied the habituation of the uh, animals into the new development. And so this is the exhibit itself. It's called the Snowden Avery. It was designed in 1964 for birds. Um, but recently, about five years ago, it was decided that we were going to place our a group of 10 colobus monkeys into this exhibit. It needed quite a lot of renovation in order to make that work, including a brand new monkey house that you can see at the back of the picture. But it's a fantastic development and a great way of giving these fantastic animals um, a lot more space. The only thing is, it's a walkthrough. It was designed as a walkthrough. And so we wanted to continue that with our colobus. And of course, this brings with it um, challenges because in the UK, there are no colobus walkthroughs. In fact, this is the largest primate walkthrough that had been planned and uh, present at, in the UK. And this is the story of how we came um, to have our colobus in this exhibit and how it's gone so far. First of all, what is habituation? Well, this is a, a basic learning principle that is essentially the decline in responsiveness to new stimulus with repeated exposure. At ZSL, we realized that we were going to have to um, instigate and plan a habituation timeline in accordance to our new development of the Snowden Avery. So first of all, we went to our senior management and asked them to sign off this policy because we knew that it needed to be a protected time built in to the project development. So if the project was to overrun, we would still get the same amount of time to habituate our animals to the new enclosure, um, despite the, the overrunning of the, um, of the development. And this also had to incorporate people like marketing and commercial areas, where of course they have to plan in things like opening um, times and events. So we got the policy signed off, which was basically just to protect this timeline. And then we created a special um, standard operating procedure, which is essentially a risk assessment. So in major exhibits, we have quite a high risk. And so we needed to plan that in. Now we've done this quite a few times with different um, species and different examples, for example, Barbarossa and Emu, where we had low risk. And actually we'd factored in two weeks before the animals were put out onto display, but we didn't really need that amount of time. And so the habituation process went quickly. However, we knew with the colobus, it was gonna be very challenging because we not only had to habituate the animals to the new exhibit and this huge space that they weren't used to, but also factor in people going in with them. And so there's various criteria that we have to risk assess um, and, um, and that's what this policy and risk assessment was all about. So how did we create our risk assessment for the Snowden development? Well, first of all, some colleagues, including Jacob, who's gonna talk about the training, went to a couple of zoos in Europe, um, Appenhall in the Netherlands and Munster in Germany. Munster Zoo in Germany is the only place we know about that has Colobus in a walkthrough facility. Now, the conditions are very different to the ones that we were going to provide in the Snowden Avery, which was a very unique structure. Um, and the, the issue with the Snowden Avery was that we couldn't touch the structure of it because it's a listed building. And so we needed to adapt our um, habituation and our husbandry in that uh, enclosure. And we couldn't compare it exactly to the various places that we were um, visiting for our research. However, we found out some great things at Munster, the challenges, but also the possibilities of um, Colobus in, in a walkthrough exhibit. And we're really grateful to our colleagues at Munster Zoo for that opportunity. Appenhall Zoo in the Netherlands has a, a rich uh, amount of experience and diverse species that are um, present in walkthrough facilities. Again, very different conditions. But unlike Munster Zoo, who don't really have a time scale or a habituation policy or, or project process, um, Appenhall do. And so we were able to learn a lot about the way they manage their animals and also a bit about, they, about how they habituate the animals to the new facilities. So here's a simple example of the way that the um, Appenhall habituation process works. Essentially, um, they're isolated into area one for one uh, weeks one to four, and then the showed ends. Then they're habituated to the bridge, so part, 
0.3 on the uh, diagram there. And then finally, they have progressive access to the walkthrough um, point four. Now, this is done uh, purely on a timeline basis because that is the way that it's worked for them in the past. Um, so we were going to develop our own timeline system of, um, of habituation too. So um, following our research at Appenhall and Munster, we decided on the Appenhall process, which is a timeline. So week one for us was going to be getting the keepers in there and understanding the functionality of the building. Then we were going to move the animals into the indoor area, indoor area for habituation, followed by recall training from the outside holding to inside dens. Month two was all about tunnel access, recall training, slow access into the main walkthrough, and then increased duration. And the third month of our controlled and protected habituation timeline was all to do with um, public being in with the animals, plus some soft launches followed by the public opening. Now, we also wanted to do a series of things before we moved the animals to the new enclosure. For example, we wanted to, to try and add in some habituation to people. But when COVID, uh, when the COVID pandemic kicked in, we just couldn't have that. We didn't have the opportunity to do any of the work that we wanted to do. So we just focused on the three things we could do. And now I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Jacob, who's going to talk us through those processes. Before the Colobus moved to their new home, there were some key behaviours and targets for us to establish. We first had to stop all public feeding of the Colobus. The group were part of the Keeper for a Day experience and fed high value foods during this time. This feeding event was stopped in 2017 when the project was granted the go ahead. Secondly, we wanted to establish a strong and reliable recall behaviour that allowed us to remotely move the Colobus around the exhibit. We also needed to give a health check to all 10 collivers before their move to ensure that they were fit and healthy to be moved to such a large dynamic exhibit. The health checks were to be conducted within three months of the move to the Snowden, so it was important that these health checks were done in the most positive way possible so as to not impact on the transport training that would have to take place after. The collivers had had limited training before this project, so we used the recall training to build the trust account between the collivers and keepers. We started by placing high value nuts into the inside dens whilst the colobus were shut out during cleaning. We inserted our whistle cue when the slide was open and gave the colobus access to the nuts. After a few repetitions of this, we stopped pre baiting the exhibit and instead rewarded the colobus by hand when they came inside after hearing the whistle. In this video, we have got the group outside with some pulses before the keeper blows the whistle to send them inside. There were a few animals that got this behaviour down really quickly, as you'll see. We relied on the group mentality for the rest of this behaviour, as once a few colobus had learnt the recall, the remaining colobus would follow them in, and eventually they learnt the behaviour for themselves and would be first animals in most days. We decided that our health checks would be done through voluntary hand injections and administered by a vet nurse. We didn't want to use a box or a crush for these hand injections as we were conscious of having to box train the colobus after their GAs. The colobus were grouped into three separate weight groups by the vet department and that enabled us to be flexible on which animal would get a GA on that day. For example, it could have been one of four animals from weight group B. We would try for the least guaranteed hand injection first and engage animal behaviour of the day. If they weren't training very well or weren't very sensible, we would continue with a normal training session and then move our focus to the next animal group until we had a successful hand injection. That is amazing. This was really important to help reduce the stress and pressure on the colobus, the keepers and the vet nurses. We built a mesh mounted shelf that correctly positioned the colobus for the vet nurse to hand inject. We can see in this video of Luna's hand injection where she's almost completely unaware of the injection until it's finished. The den has a padded floor of hessian sacks in case the animal does form.
Most of the colobus fell asleep calmly on the floor within a few minutes of their injections. During the adult training sessions, when the babies were just eight months old, they were allowed into the dens to get new foot. After a while, we had to build a mini shell for their hand injections so we could channel their enthusiasm. All three babies were successfully the smallest one, injected Jacob. by the vet nurses and went straight back Clavicle. onto the no. shelves the day after this their is After all 10 colobus had had their GAs, we started with our box training. We decided that we needed to try and move all 10 colobus in one go and in their own individual boxes. We started by creating a big table for these boxes and then added 5 boxes at first just to get them used to the process slowly. The colobus are naturally inquisitive animals so we're more than happy to explore. The addition of slides for some of the colobus made this slightly more difficult as they have a bad history of being run into boxes a long time ago. We found that the wooden slides had more issues for us so we switched to acrylic slides for all the boxes together. This allowed the colobus to feel more comfortable in the space and they could see others being trained next to them. Once they were shut into boxes, they were constantly given high value reinforcement of nuts by supporting keepers. All this box training was taking place at the same time as a building project right next to the training sessions, so some of the sessions were extremely noisy, but the colobus still responded very well. Animals that were less confident in being shut into one box could be shut into three or four boxes at a time to build their confidence and then slowly reduce down to one box. By the end of three weeks we had all our animals individually shut into boxes and calmly taken reinforcers. After all the training, it was time for the move day. This video shows the whole process from start to end and it took around 5 minutes to get all the animals in their boxes with a little bit of juggling around. We found that some of the colobus weren't comfortable being next to um, the dominant animals so we had a bit of colobus matchmaking to do so we could get the perfect order. Once they were all secured, they put on a truck and moved across site. You can see here all colobus are now secured into boxes, still taking reinforcers, and as we start the process of moving, they're taking reinforcers, they all Jake. We made sure we used blankets as an extra precaution to stop the colobus trying to run through acrylic sides, but most of the colobus stayed calm and continued to eat during the news. The babies were placed mesh to mesh with their mothers to help keep them calm across the zoo. This is the unboxing of the first colobus. As you'll be able to see, they're very comfortable in the boxes and very relaxed as they enter the dens. 
We match the mothers to their babies first, just in case the babies were a little bit more stressed. But we didn't seem to have any issues with this. Some of the colourists didn't even want to leave the box. After a while, we had babies trying to get back into boxes too. We had a nice methodical system going where we kept adding colobus to the group and we didn't get them out of the way of the den. We can't have them all, but... This is a couple of minutes after the final colobus has been unboxed, all happy in their new exhibit, browsing, exploring, grooming, all behaviours we'd like to see when they first move in. This is Colobus taking reinforcement from Keeper's hands just 10 minutes after the move day. Along with the habituation time frame, moving Colobus through the exhibit under stimulus control was an important criteria to reach before we could push through to our next steps. We use a medium value reinforcer of pulses and a simple shaker to move the Colobus between dens and paddocks. This was learnt really quickly and useful for daily management of the colobus in the house. Ah, what I got here? Following on from the shaker report and after the colobus had been given access to the aviary itself, we tested the emergency recall. At first we did a few repetitions at a closer range to re-establish the behaviour and show the colobus what they needed to do and where they were gain the reinforcement. This video is after a few sessions where we moved the location to the queue far away from the house into the bridge. As you can see, there is over 50 metres between the furthest colobus and the whistle queue. The colobus immediately start making movements to the house, and being such a large exhibit, it naturally takes some time for the colobus to make it to the reinforcement area in the right hand paddock. We have a very strict rule that for this recall, it's only done at least once a week. And this is the only time a colobus will receive monkey nuts as their reinforcement. This is to ensure we maintain the value of the nuts and the recall itself. So once we were satisfied that uh, we could recall the animals um, from the outside space to the inside space and that they were completely comfortable in their habitat, we added people um, to visit, see them from the outside. Here you can see a number of ZSL staff who were uh, invited to come and have a look at the Colobus in their brand new facility. And as you can see, um, lots of our colleagues contributed to this process and the Colobus monkeys were very interested in what they had to uh, to see here. And as you can see, the, the juveniles are bouncing around right next to our ZSL staff. And we ticked off all of our pass and fail criteria that we'd written into our um, risk assessment 
and we were able to see that they had uh, they were using all the functional uh, resources in the space they were playing they were socializing they were doing all the things that they we'd worked out that they did um, in their natural setting in their old enclosure so we were just ticking off all those criteria as we went along so as soon as they were comfortable in one area we moved them to the next and the next and so now we knew it was time to add people into the enclosure with them And like all the best laid plans, well, nothing seemed to go exactly as we expected. This was day one of having one person in the in the walkthrough. Here you can see in this um, area at the top of the tunnel, you can see one animal that's poking his head out, and that was one of the adult, the main adult males. And in the corner of the enclosure is just one individual, Kate. And I'm going to highlight that now. There's Kate sitting there. And the animals did not emerge uh, for about one and a half hours before all 10 were out in the enclosure at once. And just to show you how quickly Colobus can habituate to new stimuli, this is day two. And within four minutes, as you can see here, Kate is pretty much surrounded by Colobus monkeys. And you can see particularly on the balustrade here, there's one juvenile who is particularly um, cheeky. Um, and as you can see, very curious, very interactive. Kate is our most experienced primate keeper that we have in the zoo. She's the team leader of primates at ZSL and Predators. And so she is highly experienced. And as you can see, that might have phased um, someone who had slightly less experience to be completely surrounded by 20 kilo um, colobus monkeys and some smaller ones of course uh, but what Kate did is she just raised criteria so she realized that even on our plan was to sit still in the enclosure for another session that day well we realized that we had to raise criteria and so we consider oh, yeah, this around, process around, of the other graduated end. exposure Definitely, therapy yeah. in other words desensitization so we're measuring their behavior no, no, it's, and then deciding exactly whether we want to increase or we decrease criteria saw the speed or stimulus that they came out um, in that environment that and so to move around in so the much environment more confident. Just and, and it means that we have to raise criteria quite rapidly behavior. now. Now we might not have measured it quite right because they <laughs> went a little bit over what we expected in terms of their reaction to people on day two. But before long, we were able to add in more stimulus. So we started off by um, giving Kate a companion. Uh, so her and Glyn would stay in the enclosure and then they would circulate around and then come out and then in again. Then we'd add two, three, four more zookeepers. Until then, we could invite other members of ZSL staff, just like we did for the inside, for, the, for when they were inside and we were outside. We could just add in a few more people and then tick them through those list of criteria that we'd uh, set out in our risk assessment. There was, of course, some unusual um, stimuli that we had to factor in here. So things like umbrellas and um, different kinds of people. So young people, old people, ivy's vests and different um, things like that. And of course, we had to consider um, our accessibility. One of the things we're most proud of in this Yeah, program, I'd come and stop here so you've got a bit of distance from them. Um, take wheelchair users and mobility scooters through. But we had to make sure that the colobus were going to be comfortable. So this is our operations manager, Dan, who didn't mind being the guinea pig, um, just in case it didn't go quite to plan. But as you can see, he was able to um, wander through there on his little scooter um, with the uh, no responsiveness from the animals whatsoever. And just to give you an idea of what the experience feels like now when you walk through it, um, this is me going through um, uh, after a, a few weeks of it being open to the public, so just before the public got in on that day. And as you can see, the colobus are all outside enjoying that wonderful space. And then we have 14 metre poles in this space. The idea is, idea is the trees will grow up and uh, form a kind of canopy. Um, there's water features, as you can see there. And uh, the colobus are completely habituated and desensitised to me being in that space. They're using all of the um, facilities that we provide. Um, and there are design flaws that we're learning about. We need to connect these poles better at different um, uh, heights and also um, more, uh, more poles are needed and probably more live planting because even though they weren't supposed to like these plants to eat, we did a load of testing before they moved over there, actually they found um, fresh live trees particularly delicious. So there's plenty that we need to learn, plenty that we, we can do more of, um, but so far this whole habituation process 
even though it didn't go exactly to time, it certainly went exactly how we wanted. In other words, the Colobus told us when it was right to move to the next step. Everything was evidence-based and based upon data collection and behavior observations in which we could compare um, to collect uh, data that we'd collected in their normal habitat, in their old habitat, and we could compare that and then move them through criteria at their paced pace. And as you can see, um, the interpretation looks pretty good around the enclosure too. Just like any major new exhibit, especially ones where we're learning things all the time um, and in a brand new situation in with these amazing primates, it doesn't come without its challenges. Check out this video of my colleague Glyn conducting one of our tours. And as you can see, the Colobus have all um, decided to chill out on the walkway itself, which means we can't walk visitors through it. But we just explain that it's like being on safari. We're entering their world. And so we're um, very comfortable with them taking up that space. We don't want to displace them. We want them to be comfortable and using the whole habitat. And then we um, visitors back out the other way. Our ultimate goal with this was for the Colobus to be comfortable, happy and using this space. And, uh, and, and our visitors to be safe when they're walking in with them. And we've achieved both these things. Um, in a brilliant summer that we've really enjoyed. Um, but we have our challenges and we're going to we're going to continue to see those challenges. In other words, uh, as they get more and more confident, are we going to see more interactions between people and animals? And if so, how are we going to deal with that? And we've got some brilliant behavior management um, processes in play at the moment to encourage greater use away from the bridge. And we're going to install new platforms and walkways and increase um, the, the arboreal uh, pathways too. Thanks so much for listening to me and Jacob share some of our experiences with these fantastic animals. I really hope you enjoyed it. Thanks to Jacob for presenting and for being a fantastic trainer, looking after these animals in such a great way, along with other species. To Kate, the team leader there in the picture, um, instrumental in ensuring an evidence-based approach was implemented within this whole project. We're really grateful for that. Also to my colleagues in the evidence-based animal care team um, for all their support with the project and also for um, all the data collection and, high, and ensuring that we had a volunteer, Leslie, um, throughout that whole process. And thanks to Leslie for um, all of her hard work and to the primate team for everything they did to make sure this project was successful. I'd like to thank Lizzie and Ellie at the ABMA and in fact everyone in that organisation for inviting us to contribute to Behaviour Month. We loved it last year and we were so uh, happy to be invited back. Um, enjoy the rest of the month and we hope to see you at ZSL, at our two zoos at ZSL soon. Bye.